uh, working us with uh, great uh, patience and uh, endurance. I'm uh, grateful for his uh, effort. Uh, we had a great uh, local organization team. Uh, Although you don't see his name there, a real force uh, behind the event was Carlos Velasco, well, that I would, uh, I'm very grateful for his uh, uh, wonderful, award, for the wonderful job uh, he did. So thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Now uh, we have three uh, nice uh, awards and prizes to give. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Unicredit and University's uh, Best uh, Job Market Award. Uh, this is uh, an, uh, it's an award that uh, we have been cooperating as the Spanish Economic Association with the uh, uh, Unicredit and Universities uh, Foundation over the years. Uh, idea is uh, there's a call for uh, job market papers and among the candidates there's a selection and the candidates are invited to present their uh, work here in the symposium. Uh, this year's uh, winners are Alyosha Janssen uh, from uh, Stockholm School of Economics and uh, Mark Witte from University of uh, Oxford. They will be presenting their papers tomorrow in the job market sessions. You have the advertisement there. Uh, to give their uh, award, I would like to invite to the uh, podium Annalisa Aleati and Gian Antonio Deroni uh, and, uh, and the winners. Okay, uh, the second item on the agenda is the, uh, the series award. Uh, as you know, series is the journal of the Spanish Economic Association, uh, and uh, Spanish Economic Association awards every two years uh, a prize for the best article published in series in the previous four years. Uh, this year's uh, selection committee uh, consisted of Luisa Fuster, uh, Maya Guel, and Diego Puga. I'm very grateful for their great help. And the winner was uh, Miguel Garcia Posada and Juan uh, Mora Santighetti for their paper, Are There Alternatives to Bankruptcy? A Study of Small Business Distress in Spain. I'm particularly happy for this prize because I was the editor in charge of this paper back then. So great job of the committee. Uh, and uh, you can uh, see the uh, uh, quotation of the uh, committee. Uh, awarding this uh, prize. Uh, I will just read the first sentence. Uh, this is a novel and careful study that addresses imp an important issue and has clear policy implication. Uh, bankruptcy rates in Spain have remained among the lowest in the world, even during the recent economic crisis, and the paper tries to understand why uh, that has been the case. So uh, Miguel and Juan, if you can show up here. Let me use this uh, opportunity since we just gave uh, the serious prize to do some advertisement for the uh, journal. Uh, we have been working hard over years to uh, make series more uh, visible and uh, 
have a higher impact in the profession, and our effort seems to be paid off. Our impact factor has been rising uh, over years. You see the picture there in, in 2017. Our impact factor was 0 0.6, which is uh, quite uh, respectable given uh, all the journals uh, around. So I strongly encourage everyone to consider series as a, a wonderful outlet for their work. Okay. Now, uh, the final item in the agenda is a new initiative that uh, the association has started uh, this year. Uh, I mean, economics is uh, one of the science where I think the gap between what we teach to undergraduates and what we teach to graduates is very big. And I think any effort to close that gap should be welcome. And this is, was an initiation by the, our Education Committee, and what we uh, and the initiation is the following: uh, as you know, uh, in Spain, uh, when undergraduates finish their degrees, they write a, a final thesis. Uh, and uh, as association, we initiated a prize for the best uh, uh, graduation thesis. And uh, this year, we received, uh, we made a call, and we received 137 candidates from 31 different universities. I mean, for being the first time uh, this happened, I think this is a great number. We had a very distinguished uh, jury consisting of uh, Jordi Caballé, Antonia Cabrales, Caterina Calzamiglia, Maria Luz Marco, Ana Moro, Judith Panades, and Pedro Rey. We had uh, five runner-ups. Uh, you see their names and the topics there. When I look at this list, I was very impressed with the uh, you know, diversity of the topics that uh, the students are uh, working, and it's really uh, impressive and uh, encouraging. And then uh, the three uh, winners were, uh, at the end, after a long selection process, were Diego Arias Calvino from University, uh, University of Vigo, uh, on his work on effect of uh, taxes, uh, macroeconomic effects of taxes in a general equilibrium model with heterogeneous agents. This sounds uh, very close to what I'm going to talk about in uh, five, ten minutes. Uh, maybe he has already done what I'm doing. That's, that's great. Um, the second, uh, this is, this is uh, alphabetic, uh, the Pilar Alvar Gonzalez Munoz from Universidad Pública de Navarro. Navarra, uh, Transmission of Inequality, the Carbon Effects of Shared Custody Law in Spain. And finally, Pablo de Llanos Artero from Autonoma de Barcelona, Effects of Foreign Direct Investment on Economic Growth, Empirical Evidence from Ireland. I would like to invite the winners and the Chairman of the Education Committee, Pedro Rey, for the awards. Sorry to join the table. Uh, so let me make just two quick announcements. One is uh, the, the winners of this uh, prize are going to be presenting their posters during, the, during lunch. So please uh, stop by for five minutes and, and listen to them. And um, the second thing is the, com uh, the Education Committee is also starting a series of invited sessions in, in Symposio. There's one tomorrow at 3 p.m. So if you are interested in education and economics, we have three distinguished uh, invited speakers. So please join us. Thank you very much. OK, that ends my short spiel before I uh, deliver my address. What is yours? Okay, good morning. My name is uh, Juan Jimeno. I am past president of the Spanish Economic Association. And one of the last duties, and most gratifying duties of the past president of the Spanish Economic Association is to introduce the presidential address, which uh, surprisingly is given by the elected president of the Spanish Economic Association. So today we have the honor to have Nesit, Nesit Garner, to give the presidential address. Nesit is the first non-Spaniard president of the Spanish Economic Association. And I think that the members of the association could have not chosen anyone better than, than Nesit. Uh, Nesit came to Spain in 2006. 
and since then has done a lot for the economist profession in Spain. He has held many more positions and many more posts and many more, many more professional services than many of us. He has been professor of economics at University Carlos III, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. He has been the deputy director for the research of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. And now he is professor at CENFI and visiting scholar at the Bank of Spain. On top of that, he has been editor of Cities. He is now editor of the Economic Journal. So uh, this is good for us because you can say that to be editor of a major journal, maybe it's a good idea to start as editor of Cities. <laughs> and um, he is now, as, a, as you know, president of the Spanish Economic Association and is doing a magnificent job in these turbulent times where the association might need to rethink the activities that we do. And tomorrow in the assembly, you will hear more about uh, the rethinking that is uh, going on. Okay. So, <clears throat> before coming to Spain, Nesit studied economics in Istanbul, in Turkey, and got a PhD in economics at the University of, Roch of Rochester with a dissertation entitled The Macroeconomic Models of, Fa of the Family. He was professor of economics at Queen's University, Pennsylvania State University, and then fortunately he came to Spain and developed his professional career here with us with uh, the positions I, I told you already. His primary field of research is uh, household economics. Uh, from the title of his dissertation, Macroeconomic Models of the Family, you might guess that he has developed a very good portfolio of publications in, in this area. Many very well published in those journals. I am not going to mention all of them because I don't have time. Just let me mention a few of them with very suggested titles. For instance, Love and Money, a theoretical and empirical analysis of household sorting and inequality, marriage and divorce in World War II, social chain, the sexual revolution, from shame to gain in 100 years, an economic model of the rise in prematerial access and is the estamitization, and more recently published in the European Economic Review, Marriage and Health, Selection, Protection, and Assortative Mating. However, Nesith is not only a family man. He has very important contribution also in other fields. He has written a lot on macroeconomics, labor economics, demography, inequality, development, and public economics. And it is about public economics that he is talking today. He is going to talk about tax reform. In 2012, he published a paper in the Journal of Monetary Economics entitled Taxing Women, a Macroeconomic Analysis. So we will see today if taxing women or taxing everything else is a good idea. So Nathan, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. This is uh... okay. Now hard to keep up with this, but we will see. <laughs> okay.
So, uh, thanks a lot, Mom, for this, for this wonderful introduction. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, reforming the individual income tax in Spain. This is uh, pretty much a work in progress, freshly done. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, Javier Lopez uh, Segovia, who is a graduate student at uh, SAMFI, and Roberto Ramos from Bank of Spain, another SAMFI graduate. And at the same paper, at the same presentation, I will also mention another paper uh, which is uh, which uh, titled Spanish Personal Income Tax Facts and Parametric Estimates uh, that is joined with uh, Esteban Garcia Miralles from University of Copenhagen and again with uh, Roberto Ramos. Okay, so what I am going to talk about. Uh, in recent crises, uh, many governments uh, needed revenue and one way to need revenue is you, you increase taxes and uh, motivated with the uh, recent increase in inequality in everywhere in the world uh, there were lots of calls to increase taxes especially on the top earners okay so Spain was not an exception there was a large increase in top rates in 2012 uh, which were somehow came back in 2015 and then recently there are again talks about, you know, let's increase taxes above a certain income level. You hear in the newspapers uh, a threshold of 130,000 euro. I don't know how they come up with this number, but that's a number that people talk about. So then in this talk, I'm going to ask a very simple question. Uh, you know, how much more revenue can a government, in this case Spanish government, raise by making income taxes more progressive? Okay, so I'm not going to make a normative statement. I'm not going to talk about, okay, you take, you collect these taxes and you give to maybe people who are uh, poor and that might be wonderful for welfare. No, that's not my point. I'm just going to ask a much basic question. Okay, how much money you can raise? It's a, it's a kind of a positive question. Okay, so here is the kind of the order uh, of talk. What I'm going to do is build a standard life cycle model with heterogeneous agents. This is the type of models we teach to second year macro students all over the world. And then, you know, parameterize this model to be consistent with facts on Spain, especially inequality and taxes paid. Uh, so behind this, we will have a parametric representation of effective taxes paid in Spain. That's the second paper that I mentioned. That's where we do this. So I will refer to that paper for uh, facts. And then use this framework to compute how much uh, revenue you can get by making taxes more progressive. So that's the, that's the plan. What do we find? Well, uh, we find that, uh, you know, can the government increase its revenue from income taxes by making tax system more progressive? Answer is no. Indeed, we find that with respect to progressivity, Spain seems to be, at least given our parameterization and given our calculations, uh, it seems to be on the wrong side of the Leffer curve, so it will indeed, Spanish government would get more revenue if they lowered the progressivity of the taxes. Uh, and the main reason is that, you know, when you increase the uh, progressivity of the taxes, you create disincentives for labor supply and savings, so the economy of shrinks, so you have higher taxes, but from a shrinking economy, so that's means you are on the wrong side of the uh, left work curve. Indeed, this is the last bullet is a little bit preliminary. When you look at the total tax collection, of course, you know, you tax the income, and that's a tax collection, but there's also consumption taxes and other taxes. What we find is that the total tax collection, in t including consumption taxes, would be maximized with a proportional income tax. Again, this is a revenue statement. It's not a statement with respect to whether that's a good idea or not. It's just in terms of revenue. Okay, there's a big related literature on this. Obviously, we are not the first ones to think about uh, you know, optimal progressivity of the income taxes. Uh, there's a famous paper by uh, Juan Carlos Conesa and uh, Dirk Kruger and several follow-ups. Uh, there has been recent works on uh, this uh, Leffer curve that I mentioned. Uh, I have a recent paper in uh, Journal of Monetary Economics where the paper on Spain will build uh, on that. Uh, and there are a few papers on the tax reforms in Spain using heterogeneous agent models. There is one there by uh, Javier Diaz Jimenez and uh, Pijo Armas. 
Okay, so I'm going to first talk about the facts uh, and then come back to the model. So for the facts, we are going to use administrative data. These are basically the tax records that you can get. Indeed, it's very easy to get. You write and you make an application to the uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, and you know they send you CDs. It's very, very civilized in that sense. It doesn't, it doesn't take uh, big hurdles. And what they give you is a basically random sample of tax returns. Uh, you can see at the bottom there, for example, 2015 cross section. That's what we are going to use. It has about 2.7 million observations. These are 2.7 million tax returns. That's a big data set. And then you have whatever you put on your tax returns in, in this data set. Almost everything that you put there is in your data set. All information that is missing and I would love to get is if you have been audited and there is some information that they don't give you, but, and I've been trying to talk with them to get that, but it's not easy. So the good thing about, good thing about this data set, there is no top coding, so you have uh, very, very rich people there. That's what you want to capture. There's no top coding. There's no bottom coding. There's, uh, it's a very nice, uh, very nice data set. Uh, we are going to, there is this data set has two parts. One is cross section. You get the tax returns for, you know, for every year. And there's also a panel dimension of this, which you're not going to exploit here, but that's also very interesting. Okay. So here is just to set the, set the stage. Here is uh, to put uh, the Spanish tax collection in uh, European perspective. The total tax revenue in Spain is about you know, 34% of the GDP. That's very close to the OECD average, but somehow lower than the Euro uh, area average. And then uh, you know, out of this uh, 34%, uh, you know, the 7.2% comes uh, from the income taxes. Okay? So it's a small, relatively small number, if you think about especially Again, compared to the euro area, uh, it's relatively small, small. Where does the rest come from? Well, there is social security taxes, value added taxes, etc. Okay? But the, what we are going to talk about is mainly the personal income tax. And here is some uh, picture, just again put the Spain in, uh, in the European for perspective. Uh, we are right in the middle. Uh, there are uh, France and Denmark, they collect a lot. And there are, of course, countries that collect much less. Okay, so this is a kind of scheme of the Spanish tax system. Those of you who live here knows this very well. What you do is you declare your gross income to the authorities. That's basically, that can be labor income, capital income, and self-employment income. Then there are some deductions, uh, uh, part of social security contributions. If you have labor income, there's some automatic deductions, and then that you arrive at adjusted gross income. Then the Spanish tax system does something strange. It doesn't happen everywhere in the world. You split the income between you know, what they call a general income. This is basically labor income, self-employment, and part of capital income, and then savings income. So you split these two categories. And these two categories are taxed in different tax schedules. And uh, that basically generates a total tax liability. So basically, my, from my labor income, I pay something, and that's my tax liability. From my savings income, these are interest income, capital gains, or whatever. So I have another liability. I sum that liabilities. That's my total liability. Of course, there are some tax credits, like family allowances, uh, credits for children, etc. So what we are going to look at the end of the day, we are going to ignore this dual structure for now. We are just going to focus on, I'm going to look at your tax liabilities and divide it by your gross income in the data for everyone. I can do this for 2.7 million people. So I know your income and I know your tax liability. I'm going to divide that. That's going to give me a tax rate. Okay? So this is the, this is the you know, statutory tax rates in Spain. I took two largest regions because there are some regional differences. You see Madrid and Catalonia. I mean, this is a typical uh, tax schedule. You know, if you earn uh, little, you pay around below 20%. And for, as you earn more, you reach higher and higher uh, brackets. Of course, when we look at now, suppose I did this uh, for 2.7 million people. I did my calculation for everybody. I get a you know, tax rate and I connect uh, their income to the tax rate, I'm not going to get a picture like this. I'm going to get something much more smooth because people have different deductions, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And importantly, I'm going to get rates that are much lower. I mean, okay? Fine. 
and this is the savings part. Remember, there were two parts. This is the first one I show you. This is the labor income and the part of capital income, self-employment income, and this is the schedule on the savings income. This is, of course, much lower and less progressive. Okay, so as I said, for each tax return that I have in my data, I'm gonna compute an effective tax rate, tax, tax liabilities over gross income, and then I'm gonna describe how these effective tax rates look like. Here's the picture. So in this table, you see first column, I just, first column is the gross income. This is basically an income distribution data, okay? So what does this mean? If I look top 1% in this Spain, in the tax returns, they have about 9.5% you know, of the total gross income, okay? Uh, top 20% has about 47%. You know, you know, this, this looks like any other developed country. There's quite a bit of inequality. Of course, this is much less than the US. Like in the US, the top 1% will be on the 20, 25%. Okay, this is less than US in terms of inequality, but there is significant inequality. That's the gross income. Then you can see in the third column, distribution of tax liabilities. So now the top 1% earns about 9.5% of the income. They pay 21% of the total taxes. That, that's normal because we have progressive taxes. No, that's not surprising. So the idea is, okay, the top 1% has 9.5% of the total income, pays 21% of the total taxes. That's a number. If you look at the top 20%, they have 47% of the income and they pay about 73% of the total taxes. And as you go down, of course, both the income and the tax liabilities decline very significantly. And, and you see there is, you know, the, if you go below 40, first and second quantiles, pays almost nothing. And in the fourth column, you see the average tax rate that I calculated. These are the effective tax rates. So the average effective tax rate for the top 1% is about 30%. 30 uh, for top 20% uh, uh, is about 19%. So let's again give you an idea about what ranges we are talking about. Okay. Okay. Now, also again, to fix the ideas, these are income thresholds in this data. So what are we talking about? Who is in top 1% in the tax data? So the threshold for the top 1% is 88,000 euros. So if you earn, in the Spain, if you earn more than 88,000, you're in the top 1%. So it's, it looks low, but this is, the, this is the tax data, okay? You might say, you know, yeah, people maybe don't declare taxes, et cetera, but if you compare this data, this income distribution data with survey data, you, get, you don't get much different results. So, so you know, income, Spanish income distribution is very compact in some sense. So if you, are, if you earn more than 32,000, you are in top 20%. Again, this is, this, we are talking about a very compact income distribution. Of course, that has implications about uh, tax revenue. Okay. Okay, this is the, what, what, I, uh, what we get from the data. So I'm gonna always organize, in, the, in this talk, I'm gonna organize the data in the following way. On the horizontal axis, I will show multiples of mean income. So if one means the mean income in the Spain, 30,000 30, or whatever. So 20 something per person. So, and then it says, what, what we see is, you know, okay, if you earn very little, you pay almost no taxes, and then it increases in a concave way, and you know, it, it stabilizes around 30%. This is your average taxes, okay? This is the share of positive effective tax rates. Of course, not everybody pay taxes because your income might be low, you might have too much deductions or whatever. This is the fraction of, uh, again, by multiples of mean income, fraction of people who have positive tax liability. So if you go, I mean, even at the you know, mean income, okay, you have still 30, 40% of people paying no taxes. Okay? But again, this is not because they are doing anything wrong. This is, this is the, you know, they are following the tax system and the tax system tells them, you know, you don't owe anything. Okay. Now, of course, there is within this, there is huge variation, okay? So this is now I, now I'm kind of changing, this, changing the order now. This is by percentiles. So you see, uh, by up to 30 percentile, average taxes are kind of zero, and then it starts increasing. And you see this 
25 to 75 percentiles ranges. Okay, so it's fairly tight. But of course, there are big outsiders. So now you see here, this is a bit of a complicated picture. Uh, you have the previous picture, so the dark in the center is the means. Then you have this band, 25 to 75 percentile. Then you have a greater range. Those are the black range. That's 1.5 of the interquantile range. And then left completely outside. You see, there are some people who pay crazy taxes everywhere. That happens. Maybe you earned uh, a lot that year, somehow push you to the very high tax rate. Something happens. So there's lots of lots of richness in this data. OK, and this is the marginal tax rates. Uh, I show you the effective. Marginal tax rate, this is uh, statutory and effective. Statutory is basically you compute uh, average statutory tax rate at multiple uh, income level. Effective is uh, we do a kind of a numerical derivative. Suppose you earn 10,000 more or 10,000 less, how much your margin tax liability would change. You don't get much of a different picture. Important thing is that as the income rises, marginal tax rates increases, but then it's kind of flattens. Okay. This happens when we look at the US data, exactly you get the same picture. So one reading of this is that you know, beyond a certain income level, people put lots of effort to keep their marginal tax rates flat. There's an industry out there. And there's, there are consultants. There are lawyers. There's, an, there's a technology to keep your marginal tax rates uh, low. I'm not going to talk about that, but that's one possible interpretation. Okay. So now we have this tax data, the one that I show you. What we are going to do, we are going to try to represent this data with a parametric function. Okay. So that's the first goal. So I saw that I have a parametric function, then I can play the parameters with, of the function to see what happens in a general equilibrium model. So what kind of parametric function we are going to talk about? This is a function that has been very popular recently. This was initially proposed by Roland Benabou in a 2002 econometric article. Uh, that's your total tax liabilities. I is income. There are two parameters. One is lambda and one is tau. Okay, And, uh, and your average tax rate at the bottom is 1 minus lambda times income to the power minus tau. So what, why this functional form? Okay, Why this is interesting? Well, because this has two parameters, lambda and tau, and each control one thing. The lambda controls the average taxes, and the tau controls the progressivity. How? Let me show you why. Take this as the average tax rate. I'm going to look at the ratio of, not the tax rate, but take home rate, one minus the tax rate. So in, in, that, in the ratio in the middle, you have, in the numerator, you have uh, 1 minus taxes for someone who earns x times the income. And below, you have someone who earns just the i, i and x times i. If you take that ratio, given that tax function, things nicely cancel, and you end up with lambdas and everything cancel, you end up with x to the power minus tau. And as long as tau is positive, Taxes are progressive in the sense that take-home rate is bigger for lower income. So, and in the extreme, if tau is zero, you have proportional taxes. So that's the, that's the nice thing of this function. You have, uh, when the tau is zero, taxes is one minus lambda. If lambda is, let's say, 0 0.9, everybody pays 10%. If lambda is 0 0.7, everybody pays 30%. As the tau moves away from zero, becomes positive, you get more and more progress. Okay. So this is, uh, we, we fit this with some fancy econometrics or non-fancy econometrics. So this is what we get. Now, HSV stands for heat cold stress and violente. We use, uh, they made this uh, functional form popular uh, recently. And this is, so, so what I'm going to do is uh, this, uh, the red one, I'm going to take that, put in my general equilibrium model, and then play around with these parameters, especially tau. Because when you play with the tau, this function is going to rotate. Remember, when the tau is zero, it becomes flat. Tau is bigger, more progressive. Tau is smaller, less progressive, and see what happens. But one thing to keep in mind, OK, this is, this, I find this uh, picture quite mind-blowing. So again, that's the tax, that is my tax function, OK, the black one. I impose on top of that the distribution of income 
in Spain from the tax returns. So what you see is that while we are talking about those you know, 30%, 25% that up there, there are very few people there. I mean, again, the Spanish income distribution is very compact. You see lots of people accumulated, you know, twice the mean income. By the twice the mean income, you get already lots of lots of income. So, so by making, I mean, you can, you can see here now, by increasing taxes at the very top, you're not going to get much action if you don't have many people there. So that's kind of going to be the, a little bit of the uh, message. Okay, so now comes the model part. So, uh, until when do I have? Okay, perfect, good. Okay, great. Uh, so what are the model? It's a very standard life cycle model. As I say, this is what we teach to second year graduate students uh, following uh, Huggett's uh, JME article. It's a life cycle economy. People, uh, J is gonna be your age. You start at age one, you retire exogenously at some age R, and then you die at age N. Uh, the key thing is that you face idiosyncratic risk. I mean, this is the you know, macro view of inequality, why people are unequal, because we face shocks. Okay, so that's the kind of the way we generate inequality in these models. Agents can save, but they are not allowed to borrow, and there are no annuities, etc. This can be, borrowing can be relaxed, annuities can be relaxed, I don't think they will change the results. Very standard uh, preferences. You care about the expected discount with utility. You discount with beta. You have survival probabilities. And we have, a, again, standard macro preferences, lock consumption minus this utility from uh, work, where gamma is the fresh elasticity. Obviously, in this kind of exercises, fresh elasticity is important. If uh, fresh elasticity is high, people are going to react a lot to the taxes. If lambda if gamma is very low, they are not going to react much, so you can collect more revenue. Okay. So what is the shock structure? Here it is. So this is, again, fairly standard. At any point, any HJ, your, inc your productivity consists of three elements. There is theta, which is a fixed effect that's with you all your life. So when you enter this economy at age 25, you draw a theta, and you are, you know, that puts you above or below the mean. Everything is here. This is in log, so everything is above or below the mean. E bar will be just an average profile that everybody faces by age. So think of this 25 years old, 26 years old, 27 years old. There will be an age profile that is E. But then some will be lucky and unlucky, and permanently will be above this profile or below this profile. Plus, there will be the Z, there will be shocks. So again, there's an average earnings profile or wage profile that we all face. Some are lucky and some are unlucky. They are permanently above or below this. On top, some are super unlucky and they get bad shocks. Those are going to be the epsilon shocks. And some are super lucky and they get good shocks. So then there will be basic inequality will diverge as we age. This is the typical in any kind of macro model with life cycle structure, this will happen. So there are basically, uh, rho is an important parameter because it determines how much the shocks are persistent, these epsilon shocks that feed to the Z. The theta is important, that gives you the permanent differences, okay? And then we are gonna do one more trick when you, in order to fit the data, we are gonna say, well, there are two types of people. This theta, the fixed effect, there are people who are normal. They draw from a normal distribution. And then there are some guys who are really, really lucky. They're going to call them superstars because this will be necessary to generate enough income inequality. There are other tricks to do it, but this will do it. So there will be basically what the a fraction of people will draw super thetas. Okay. Now, what does the government do? Government taxes. Okay. There will be a progressive income tax. There will be some additional tax on capital income. There will be a consumption tax. There will be a social security tax, but social security tax is just, it will finance the social security system, nothing else. This is the budget of a typical individual. You have your endowment, that's E, that depends on the shocks. Omega represents all the shocks that you face. You pay payroll taxes, that's tau. You have your assets income. Then you pay taxes on your capital income plus 
taxes on your labor and capital income. That the, 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 the T, capital T is the progressive taxation. And then B will be social security transfers if you are retired. What you do with this income, you either save, that's A, J plus one, or you consume. If you consume, you pay uh, taxes. On the background, we have a neoclassical production function. Doesn't do much, it just determines factor prices. Okay. What is the value function of uh, a working agent? Uh, you have your assets and you have your shocks, that's your state. You choose next period assets and how much you work. Very standard problem, okay? Now, what does, uh, you have to be careful here, of course, when you decide how much to save and how much to work, you take into account the fact that these things affect your taxes. Because you are aware, I many people understand that they, they face a progressive tax schedule, so they work more, they're going to pay more taxes. So that's, that's, that's building. If you are retired, life is boring. You just get your social security income and pay taxes. Nothing there. So we are going to calibrate this model with the US, uh, sorry, Spanish data. So your people are going to retire at age 65, die at 81. Uh, this, can, this thing is not particularly important. Survival probabilities we are going to take from the Institute of uh, Statistics in Spain. Standard values for capital share and depreciation. Now, important thing here is the shocks. Okay, so where do you cons how do you construct these shocks? So first we are going to construct an average earning profile for individuals, and that comes from encosta the uh, survey of living conditions. This is uh, basically a survey of asking people, you know, how much you work, how much you earn, etc. This is not a panel. It's a cross-section. So from this cross-section, we need to construct an age profile, and you just basically run a simple regression of uh, mean hourly wages for age A, year Y, on a bunch of age dummies and the year dummies, and you get that. And you get a picture like this. This is normalized by average income in, the, in Spain. So that means you, know, you see the typical life cycle profile. You start uh, income being low, and then you go up. This is everybody, males and females. This is easy. Now, for the shocks, we need some more tricks. So what does these shocks do in this economy? Okay. So again, we all start, we all face this profile, and then some of us are lucky and some of us are unlucky. If you have a high theta, it puts you up. If you have a low theta, it puts you down. If you get good shocks, you, grow, you go up. If you go bad shocks, you go down. Basically, these shocks generate inequality. Okay? So one way to do it, basically, you look at this picture. What is this? This is the variance of log wages in the US, in the Spain. Too many papers on the US. So uh, uh, variance of log wages in Spain. So it goes from you know, 0 0.15 to 0 0.3, about 15 log points. This gives you all the information you need to figure out that parameters. How? Well, the inequality at age 25 tells us something about these permanent differences. Because at that age, that's the only thing we have. The curvature of this curve Curvature of this line tells you how, how big is the row. Because if row is close to one, this is going to be a kind of a linear line. Because the shocks are persistent. So out of this very standard procedure, we get these parameters. Just to put, per, put in perspective, if you do the same exercise with the US data, you would get much bigger numbers. Because inequality is bigger. Like the theta would be like three times big at least. So because just the levels of inequality are much bigger. And then another thing you can use as an information is the covariance of shocks. So in the sense that this is how much my shocks that I get today, my wage, is related to my wage in the previous period, etc. Here you see the legs for different ages. So again, these are very nice linear curves. Your, of course, your wage today is very correlated with your wage last period, but as you go back, the correlation goes down. From these two figures, you can figure out those numbers. So there are a few other parameters. We have beta, discount factor, gamma, uh, weight on the leisure, uh, and superstars, etc. And we pick these numbers to match. By. We are going to take gamma equal to 1. I'm going to comment on that. That's on the high side of the estimates. The rest are very standard parameters. So the 
we are going to say the top 1% are going to have this theta equal to 2.2. That means, you know, uh, when you are born, you are, you know, twice higher the average guy. So that's what we need. Okay. And then parameters uh, of the tax function are going to come from our previous analysis of the Spanish tax data. We are going to impose an additional capital tax of 16% to collect 2.3% of the GDP. That's how much corporate income tax uh, is collected in Spain. Social security tax is uh, chosen so that we have the right replacement rate again in the Spain. And consumption tax is going to be like 15%. Okay? This is the consumption tax in Spain by different income quantiles. It's fairly flat. You know, people consume more or less the same bundles, and we have about 15%. Here you have the uh, parameters. They don't mean much. Let me skip this. So how well we do? Well, this is still preliminary. The data is what I showed you in the beginning. That's the distribution of income from the tax data, and that's the model. I mean, we are doing fairly well. We, are we, are, we have at the bottom, you know, our, we have still not enough inequality in the following sense. Uh, you know, if you look at the bottom 20%, we have too much income there. We match the top 20%. Uh, uh, in the model, our top 1% is a little richer. We need to do some uh, further work here, but uh, so far, so good. And then if you, uh, and this is the, uh, this is the labor income, and and this is the total income. That's the gross income, labor and capital. Again, again our bottom 20% has maybe too large of a share, but overall, it's not bad. And this is the tax. This is now the tax payments. Okay? And that's there we do, you know, one thing that we match very well is the top 1% pays 21% of the total taxes, both in the model and in the data. Okay? And, you know, overall it's not bad. Our, you know, at the bottom maybe our guys pay a little bit too much. Because in the end, that the, the tax function that fits the Spanish data best is not what I show you. Indeed, it would be something, no tax, a kink, and then you start paying. But we didn't have time to integrate the kink in our simulations yet. Okay, so these are, now this is income taxes, how much you pay. This is total taxes including the consumption. Of course, once you, look, once you include the consumption taxes, which is much more flat, you get a tax distribution, tax liability distribution that is much less, much more, you know, here this, this was 21% of the income tax, but the top 1% pays only 11% of the total taxes. So it's got a very different picture, okay? So it's, it's important to think about that. Okay, now what we are going to do, we are going to say this was our This is our parameters, lambda and tau for Spain. Tau is 0 0.15 almost. So I'm going to start changing tau and see what happens. Remember, as I move tau smaller, I make it less progressive. If I move tau higher, I make it more progressive. OK. And just to fix the ideas, here are three pictures. The red one is the benchmark economy. The yellow one is with a higher tau, you make it more progressive. And the blue one is when you make it less progressive. This function is always going to rotate at mean income by its construction. So by making it less or more progressive, basically you are shuffling the taxes above the mean and below the mean. That's what you're doing. So here's what we get. Here everything is normalized by 100 with the benchmark economy. So I have output, hours, labor supply, capital, and revenues. Revenues is from income tax, corporate income tax, consumption tax, and all taxes. So here's what we get. Well, basically, by making taxes more progressive, if you move on the other side, you're not going to get any more revenue. That's not going to happen. You might get more revenue from the income tax by lowering the progressivity, and we find that around 0 0.08, you reach the peak of the Leffert curve. However, if you want to maximize all taxes, you should go all the way to the proportional tax. I don't want to comment too much on that. I want to focus on the revenue from income taxes. Basically, this is the Leffert curve we generate for the spend. The horizontal line, uh, vertical line is where we are. 
and the peak of the Leffert curve is around, you know, progressivity of 0 0.08. What does that progressivity of the 0 0.08 means? Okay, it means this. So basically, the benchmark and progressivity that is maximized is the Leffert curve. So the basically, for top 10 percent, average tax rate should go down from 20 to 16 for top 1%, 32 to 23. This is what uh, basically our calculations suggest. Suggest reason is that in this model, you know, the labor supply, capital, and output decline very strongly as you make the taxes more progressive because people react by working less and accumulating less savings. So basically, by lowering progressivity. People work more and they save more and you end up taxing at a lower rate by the bigger economy. That's what you get. And then basically the distribution of tax liabilities will change. Similarly, if you move from the current system to peak of the Leffert curve, where you will basically shift the tax burden to the lower income quantiles. So the, so the message we get is at least given our calculations and our calibration, there doesn't seem to be room to increase progressivity and collecting more taxes. Just to set up this, just to fix these ideas in terms of more numbers that we can connect, again, the benchmark economy and uh, progressivity that maximizes the Leffert curve, GDP per capita goes up from 27,000 to 30,000. Income taxes per capita would go from 32,000 to 33,000, and the total tax collection per capita will go from 11,000 to 12,000. So, there's by lowering progressivity, you collect quite a bit, bit more taxes. And as I say, this mainly happens because as you change progressivity, labor supply reacts big time. Uh, for example, in the, at, all diff, at all levels of income distribution, higher progressivity implies lower labor supply and means lower asset accumulation. So if you basically, if you move from the current benchmark to let's say a progressivity of tau is 0 0.2, you increase, you decrease the labor supply by almost 5% for all income levels. And same way, if you increase progressivity, people at the top accumulate much less assets and that hurts the aggregate economy. Now, you might say, well, I mean, you are a kind of, you know, Chicago, Minnesota, Rochester type of guy who believes that these elasticities of labor supply are very big, okay, so that people react to taxes, so taxing is a bad idea. Well, I, we did the same exercise with, we lowered the labor supply elasticity to half. Still, we are on the wrong side of the Leffert curve. Much less, so now that this was the bank, so the, uh, the blue one was the benchmark economy. We calibrated with a high elasticity. Red one is the low elasticity. Still, then maybe it suggests that the uh, uh, progressivity tau should go down from 0 0.15 to 0 0.12, maybe not to 0 0.8, but you are still on the wrong side of the Leffert curve. So we might try, let me just uh, do two things. You might say, okay, rather than shifting this, playing with taxes, it whole whole tax schedule, why not just put some additional taxes on the top? Okay? Top one percent, top five percent, less increase. Okay, we can also do that. So basically what I what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna find the income threshold in my economy for top one percent, top one, top five percent, and says, those guys, you're gonna pay X percent higher. Okay, I can do that. And I'm gonna look at how much they need to pay more to maximize the total revenue. Okay, if I do that, just look at the highlighted one for top one, top five percent. What I find is that if you, if this guy, if we charge everybody about top five percent, top five percent, thirty-eight percent marginal tax, that's going to be the revenue maximizing. Okay, and but the tax collection, you're going to get just zero point two percent increase in taxes. Very little. I mean, you can get some money, but it's not much. Okay. For top 1%, again, if you want to maximize the income tax collection from those guys, you should tax them at a marginal tax rate of 48%, effective. Okay, this is important because currently they are uh, facing potentially higher, higher 
marginal taxes, but this is basically effective. You force them pay this. You're gonna, you can do a little bit better. You're going to go about 1.3% higher taxes, but we are talking about small potatoes here in terms of, in terms of the how much tax collection. Finally, you can think of these recent proposals, like you know, they were on the newspapers. You increase the uh, taxes for everyone who earns 130,000 by two percentage points. If you earn more than 300,000 by four percentage points, I mean, you look at those income distribution numbers. There are very few people out there. Okay, and if you do that, yes, you get some collection, but the effects are again very minuscule. Minuscule. The total tax collection increases by 0.1 percent. So there is not much there to tax, at least given the, given the income distribution data that we have. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, can government increase income taxes by making the tax system more progressive? Our preliminary answer is no. That's how we reach that uh, uh, answer. Of course, there are many issues that are left untouched. So, so here we are talking about an individual. We can think about households, household labor supply. We, we don't talk about transfers. Here, the government collects the money and throws to the ocean. Of course, if, if government collects that money and redistributes, maybe people will like it. That's a very different question, OK? So you can make uh, people happy. We don't have separate taxes on capital and labor as the Spanish system, but that's something we can do. We don't talk about tax evasion. We are taking the tax data as that's the truth. You can, I mean, that's, uh, that's not a something we can, we can uh, worry about, whether that's really. But, but as I say, the income distribution data you got from the taxes looks very similar income distribution data you get from very reliable surveys for the Spain, like the you know, Spanish household finances survey by the, by the bank. So you don't, this doesn't look like, you know, except uh, for the self-employed, where there you see some differences. For self-employed, you see there's a potential underreporting. But this is something we might uh, work. And again, we are here, this is a positive paper, not a normative paper. Again, you can collect these taxes from the richer people and redistribute to poor, and this can be welfare improvement. That's not my point. My point is that there's just not much money out there to collect given the current system and given the current income distribution if we take those in face value. Thanks a lot. For question, and I think that the presentation, this presentation deserves many, many questions. So please, Evi, and then Miguel. Just their labor supply yeah. and savings. But, but it's a closed life. economy. They could migrate. Uh, they of could do other stuff. No, no. So these yeah. estimates that you give is kind of a lower bound. Possibly. It I mean, could be even worse. Um, there's a recent paper by Mark Huggett. Uh, he, he does a similar exercise in a model with human capital accumulation and gets much bigger effects. Yeah. And so. the other thing I wanted to tell you is that in your data, do you have also, you said you have the self employed, right? Yes. So what you could do is you could calculate. Uh, like you could uh, try to, to, to look at uh, your model where you look at the self-employed versus the, yes. the other workers because there you could get different numbers also like uh, for, the, for the persistence parameter on this and then the labor supply elasticity could be different for these guys. That's a good point, yes. And, and yes. you could investigate yes. that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation, Nessie. Um, I'm used to look at these topics with different methods, sure. but this, this was very interesting for me. One thing I would add to the last slide you had is fiscal externality. So I'll, we know that a lot of high-income people in Spain, they don't pay income tax, they pay uh, profit tax. So I think that's something I would uh, kind of include in the model. Yes. If, if you raise taxes on high incomes, more people are going to exactly. move to the corporate exactly. income I mean, tax The key base. thing is that, you know, I mean, the problem is that, you know, and this is a project we are working on as well. Uh, so in the sense that, you know, how uh, can we estimate a technology to transfer your labor income to capital income? I mean, there are some work done already on this with, uh, in the US. So I think that's, that's something interesting. I thought this was, uh, this, 
was a big U.S. phenomena with, uh, you know, uh, stock options, etc. But I think it's also happening uh, possibly in Spain. So there is a, uh, there is uh, there is a way of shifting your labor income to capital income, and the, uh, these are taxed in very different rates. And I would add just one thing that we should all try to convince the Institute of Fiscal Studies to also have a sample of data or the universe on the corporate income tax, which That's they don't currently absolutely. have. And I think that would be very useful no. for. Yes. <laughs> More questions? No? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so, so thank you very time. much. It's time for lunch. Uh, I hope you. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy the, the symposium and I encourage you to, to attend the session, the plenary sessions, and the general assembly of the association tomorrow because. We need to discuss big, big decisions. Okay. No, of course.